My baby dolls, we are back again, another episode of Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and we bring back another great, great guest again. We got Tim Whittell on our show today, and of course, we had Tim on last month for the summer of 68, and of course, that was between uh, the whole 68 season we went through, and of course, you can find it on the archives of Genesis on YouTube, Spreaker, and of course on iTunes. We we had a fantastic show talking about the events of 68 and Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, and we talked uh, we talked about Bob Gibson and Denny McLean, and we had so much fun that. We're bringing Tim back to talk about the 1991 baseball season and with his wonderful book, Down to the Last Pitch. And if anyone remembers the 91 series, it was a series for the ages, and I remember it. And one of the things I do remember uh, was, of course, Jack Morris going 10 innings, and we'll talk about that. But I do remember the home team won all their games. The Twins won the first two. The Braves won the next three, and then you had the Twins winning the next two. So that was uh, something that, um, when you look back on it, it's like clearly amazing. You are listening to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho. And Ralph got me uh, doing some A's stuff with him lately on the Oakland A's program, and been having a lot of fun with that. I do uh, Giants baseball uh, with them, with the Z and F, the zigzag man, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, this week we're going to go back to the uh, turn of the century with John McGraw, and we're going to talk about his life and career. We're going to talk about contemporary San Francisco uh, Giants and how they're starting to improve in the standings, and they're climbing out of the cellar. Uh, and, of course, I've... Uh, I also do a show with Alan Blumkin, who is the chief historian of Saber, and of course, good old Dave Nemec, who has been writing uh, for the last 45, 50 years. Of course, he has written the definitive book of uh, Sam Shepard, and of course, he has an illustrious career of writing many, many baseball books and articles uh, from the 1970s onward, and you can catch me on their show as well all here on the Comfortably Zoned Network. And so we turn now to down to the last pitch. And, you know, you would think that when you chronicle the World Series, it's just going to be about that. But it really isn't. When you read this book, when you pick up this book, the book was released in 2014, so it's a few years old. But when you pick up this book, it's so much more. Yes, It goes in a documentary-style fashion, game one, game two, but it veers off into wonderful sections, which we'll get into. Ricky Henderson breaking the, uh, you know, stealing stolen base record by Lou Brock. It goes into Nolan Ryan, his seventh uh, no-hitter at the age of 44, the building of Camden Yards and the beginning of what, um, you know, what modern baseball is all about now. Big salaries, union troubles. It all begins, and of course you don't have the Yankees, Dodgers, Giants, uh, uh, Mets, Red Sox, because this is way before that. And we're going to get into this wonderful discussion uh, with Tim. And of course, as a reminder, Tim was a founding editor of U.S. USA Today's Baseball Weekly, and I remember that, uh, and is the award-winning and highly acclaimed author of 11 books, including the summer of 68, and I think he has a few more. This was a few years ago. He has served as an exhibit advisor to the Baseball Hall of Fame and is currently writer-in-resident at St. John Hopkins University, and of course, he lives near Washington, D.C. Without any further ado, welcome back to the show, Tim. Great to be back with you, Ian. Everything good, huh? Everything's going good. You know, every day I can get out of bed, it's a good day. People don't realize that. <laughs> That's right. You know, you know, name of the old bits, it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, you know, why revisit this period, uh, Tim? Because um, I think for some of the things, Ian, you were just touching on, first of all, we have an epic World Series. Uh, I call it the greatest of all time. Certainly some people would disagree, but certainly – on the short list of any great World Series. You had 
five games decided by one run. Four games go down to the final at bat, which hence, you know, down to the last pitch. And three games, including game seven, go into extra innings. Uh, it's also, in a sense, holds you know, 69 innings in total, had the longest uh, seventh game, uh, you know, record for inning seventh game uh, in history. And and so you have an epic World Series. I have a, I have some skin in the game. I'll, I'll be I'll admit it. It's the first World Series I covered. I came close to covering uh, 1987 with the Giants, but they lost in Game Seven of the NLCS to St. Louis. Um, I had come kind of close with the Oakland A's, but then moved from the Bay Area to the East Coast, so kind of missed out on that run. And so it's personal for me too. But also, as you pointed out, this is the pivot point on so many things between then and now. Part of its salaries, believe it or not, the Oakland Athletics, which become the poster child for Moneyball in the not-too-distant future after 1991, have one of the largest payrolls in the game at this point in time. We have this real pivot point, which you just mentioned, which I think is huge, with the building of Camden Yards, and suddenly everybody wants these kind of uh, fan-friendly boutique stadiums or ballparks downtown. And also, it's really kind of the turning point for two franchises in the Bra- with the Atlanta Braves and um, the Minnesota Twins. And, you know, it's, it, we'll maybe tease this out, but it kind of offers that almost Faustian, Faustian bargain a little bit. You want a championship right now, and that means you're going to become maybe after it, almost an afterthought when it comes with contenders. Maybe you're even going to be rumored or talked about seriously being contracted, being put out of existence altogether. All of this will happen to the Minnesota Twins. Or do you lose it? Do you lose the championship one to nothing in 10 innings, an in extra innings, and just sticks with you so much? that, in a sense, it becomes the catalyst to push you on to keep coming back to the playoffs 23 more seasons, which was the Atlanta Braves. So it, it, I love kind of going back in time, and some of it back to when I really sunk my teeth in the baseball, and this is also the first year of Baseball Weekly, which was so much fun. I mean, we didn't even have a budget. It was like, oh, you want to go cover that? Go do it. And so, but then as I got deeper in things like Camden, salaries, what happens to two kind of major baseball organizations. It became really, really um, a lot of fun to tease out. I remember Baseball Weekly, too. I who knew that, you know, 26 years later I'd be speaking to you here on a show. So, you know, you just never know. <laughs> I, I it's so, it's never so know. funny how things, Ian, things will, will just kind of turn. I had worked at the National. Um, and that went out of existence. I was the sports business uh, columnist for the National, and I'm thinking, boy, how am I going to keep my hand in the game? I, I love doing this. And then really Baseball Weekly happened. It seems so ludicrous to, to say this at this point in time uh, today, but it's because the Sporting News decided not to run a complete list every week of the box scores. And that left the door open, in a sense, for USA to start up Baseball Weekly, and we were going to carry it. And, of course, fantasy or rotisserie baseball was taking off, and um, and, and that became the, the, the starting point, and it was so much fun. I mean, that was, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, the national was a lot of fun, but Baseball Weekly for me even more so. I felt like the circus had come to town and climb aboard. Who knows where we're going, but we're going to have some fun. And you, and you know something? Before cable, before smartphones, before getting the stats every two seconds on your smartphone when someone scores like I do for my favorite teams, you had the box scores. I mean, I used to remember waking up in the morning and, and, and then going to the door to get the newspaper to see the box scores of the, of the uh, night uh, game before because I couldn't stay up to watch it. You don't have that anymore. So people yeah. out of younger audiences – you know, uh, you've just painted a portrait of how life was like back then, saying, oh, look, we're going to run the box scores. You know, they left the door open because they didn't put that. The box scores were so <laughs> important because baseball is a game of stats. Yeah, and, and you can just tease out the stories and go off these series of numbers if you can read it the right way, and you can make a whole story out of it. And, and what 
what's mind-boggling, Ian, and you well know this, it's not that long ago. We're talking 25, 26 years ago, yeah. and, you know, how much the world has changed. But I, I'm with you. I mean, that's the first thing I used to do every morning was get the get the sports section, look at the box scores. And like I say, I, I grew up, the first teams I covered were the Giants, San Francisco Giants, Oakland A's, and the Bay Area. And just being able to make a whole story out of box scores was just so much fun. Let me ask you this question. It just dawned on me right now, because you just mentioned how the game has changed in 25 years. Now, we spoke about the summer of 68 last month, and everyone loved that show, too. Uh, you know, I don't give myself any credit because it's all about you guys, your work, your mind. Do you think baseball changed more from 1968 to 1991 or from 1991 to 2017? Which one do you think had a bigger change period? I think it's the latter, Ian. And I think it's somewhat because of the impact of, well, one team, the Oakland Athletics, and how they started to use their bullpen with Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan. And being so, you know, certainly this was done before. Hey, let's match up. We'll go righty versus righty, lefty versus lefty. But they were so methodical about it. And um, really looking at, the, in a sense, the, the book of stats, which had the stats, again, in the, in the dugout, looking through, okay, how's the matchup here? And the other, you know, the other thing that happened, and he's a character in down to the last pitch, even though he's not either on the Twins or the Braves, obviously, is Dennis Eckersley. To reinvent, certainly we had closers beforehand and everything, but certainly took it to a different level and suddenly really was took it from being a starting pitcher and very begrudgingly was forced into this role of being um, the closer to the A's and fought it tooth and nail. And yet, if you talk to X today, well, that's how I ended up in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, I maybe wasn't that interested in being a closer. I may have pushed back against Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan, but they certainly put him in a place to succeed. And suddenly the whole, all baseball changed. It's not only matchups. It's everybody's got to get an Eckersley and, um, or, or, you know, and fashion their bullpen in, okay, we got our seventh inning guy. we got our setup guy in the eighth. It's leading to our closer now in the ninth who's going to nail it down. I think that's changed baseball a ton. And the teams that couldn't, couldn't fashion their bullpen that way or for sure couldn't find a closer at least in the image or in the role of an Eckersley uh, had real trouble. It was when I was doing down the last pitch, Jim Cott, who was sideline reporter uh, for CBS during the series, did an outstanding job and, of course, was, um, you know, a great pitcher for the Twins. He pointed out to me, he was one of the last interviews I did, and we were just, I was just trying to, you know, catch up on things a little bit. And he's the one who pointed out, he said, if the Braves had found a closer halfway as good, say a Dennis Secretary, or even like a Rick Aguilera, who was the closer for the Twins at this period of time, he feels the Braves would have won three, maybe four World Series titles during the 90s. And you look back and, you know, they had some guys in the running, but nobody really panned out in that way. So there's a very roundabout way of answering your question. But I, I think so much of baseball – changed between 68 and 91 bullpen ballparks salaries um it became what it is today you know love it or leave it and uh and and the changes i think caught a lot of teams a lot of individuals off guard and you know not only not only in that sense as well but of course you know i always you know mention marvin miller i mean without him mm-hmm. There would not be these big salaries as you have today. And, again, his influence was felt way into uh, the 90s when you had a whole uh, strike season in 94 because the, the, the Major League Baseball Player Association was now on equal footing with the owners. But you know what you mentioned? You mentioned Dave Duncan. And not a lot of people know about Dave Duncan. And Dave Duncan would assist uh, La Russa for 30 years with both the A's. I think the White Sox A's and Cardinals he took him with. Dave yep, Duncan, you're right. 
Dave Duncan was on the uh, Swinging A's in the 70s and won those um, championships, those World Series, with the Charlie Finney. And he was able to know that Raleigh Fingers, again, you know, Raleigh Fingers was a starter who couldn't be a starter. He couldn't go those innings. And so he, like Dennis Eckersley, begrudgingly went into the bullpen, but he became super effective. Mm-hmm. Dave Duncan, I think, is one of the unsung heroes of this era in baseball. And as yeah. I alluded to, I, mean, I, I cut my teeth covering the A's and the Giants late 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, two kind of memorable teams, and the A's are pulling it together, and, you know, Ricky and, you know, Jose Canseco, et cetera. But when I would go over and cover those games in Oakland, I would always try to spend a little bit of time, if he had time, with Duncan. As I always learned so much about the game. And it wouldn't be something maybe I was going to use in tomorrow's story. I was working for the San Francisco Examiner, and uh, I, had, I had a fair amount of time to pull together, you know, longer pieces. But he just opened my eyes. He was a great, you know, the insights you would have on the game. And if you were... If you weren't a complete idiot and spent some time with him, you just became a smarter baseball person. And 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 Lewis has said it. I mean, Lewis has said it through the years. I mean, Lewis does not end up in the Hall of Fame. Does not end up with the record he has without being joined at the hip with uh, Dave Duncan as his right hand man. So, um, you know, very extraordinary guy. I mean, he's one of those guys. I'm always a little surprised by didn't manage himself. And I think I would have been very intrigued by what kind of teams he could have put together. But I don't know if that was his – I don't think it was his mindset or his temperament. He likes to be a little bit more in the background. He likes – reminds me being a little bit today of Mike Maddox, you know, now with the Nationals, used to be with the Rangers. Um, genius when it comes to pitching and trying to set up bullpens and matchups and such. And just one of those classic kind of – Old time baseball guys. That the more time you spend around them, the more you learn. And you know, if you don't read about baseball, if you don't do your research, you know, you realize that a lot of these pitching coaches, you know, don't get a lot of credit. Uh, and, and you know, it's usually the manager that either rises or falls with a ball club. Anyway, but let's take Mel Stoudemire with the Yankees. Mm-hmm. Instrumental. I mean, for God's sakes, the Yankees the Yankees threw out Mel Stoudemire in 1975, two weeks before he was to receive a pension from the Yankees for being there for yeah. uh, 10 years. Uh, excuse me, 74. I was speaking to Fritz Peterson. I usually speak to Fritz uh, quite often. He tells me the inside games. But he always said, you know, he had some of the best pitching coaches uh, under Ralph Huck and uh, – you know, if you go back in time, you, you had you had the big train, Walter Johnson. Um, he wasn't a great manager, but he was a great pitching coach because that's what he knew how to do. Dave Duncan was a catcher, so he knew, you know, the different styles of uh, throwing the ball and uh, and uh, the different strategies. Because the catchers, they don't even get as much credit. They're the field generals, for God's sake. It's the most difficult position to play, even more than pitcher. Very much so. I don't think they get enough credit, and and Duncan's just one of many in that. I mean, he had this innate ability. You know, we're talking matchups, but but just to go, hmm, I think this guy, this pitcher can get that guy out. And I don't know if it came from being a catcher and being so close to it all, and and having that kind of what they call it, God's view of baseball. You know, that that catchers have. But um, he was great, and 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 I and I miss him being out of the game. I miss catching up with him just simply because again, I would always learn something. I love Dave Duncan. And you know what, Eckersley? Eckersley was another one. I mean, he was he was a bad boy that was heading down the wrong road. Um, he was traded to the Cubs from, I think, the Red Sox. Uh, he was uh, he was there, and uh, he was going through an alcoholic period in the 1980s. And Dallas Green who managed the Philadelphia Phillies in 1980 was the was the coach of the Cubs, and he told Eckersley, "Kid, I'm going to ruin your career for embarrassing me." <laughs> and and so they got rid of him. And and guess what? Dave Duncan 
and Tony La Russa get him, and he pitches well into his 40s with the hiccup of throwing that uh, pitch to Kirk Gibson in the 88 <laughs> World Series, right? So yeah, I always one hiccup. Thought, I, you know, that small hiccup where you see, you know, Kirk Gibson hobbling around, and everyone was surprised that sort of put Gibson in there because of his injury to begin with. Yeah, very much so. And then I think it shows how classy a guy he is that, you know, Eckersley will talk about it. Eckersley will tip his cap to Gibson, you know, made a mistake on the pitch, but, you know, Gibson put it out. But it's funny, you talk to Eckersley, and there's two things he always will talk about that were turning points in his life. I'm not talking about his career. I'm talking about his life. One is joining Alcoholics Anonymous and really, you know, Pulling, getting his act together, not being the bad boy anymore. And the other one was, in a sense, what, what Duncan and La Russa did in moving him to the bullpen. And I cannot understate how much he fought that. I was covering the team then, and he was not a happy camper. I mean, he was very public at times. He, you know, he said, they've got a, they've got a closer. They've got this guy, Jay Howell. I'm a starting pitcher. And um, yet, to his credit, even though it rubbed him the wrong way. He did it. And he's a smart guy. <laughs> After it wasn't going to take too long to figure out, hmm, you know, I've got the stuff to do this. I've got the temperament to do this. And you know something? I'm on a pretty good team, and this is like the missing link. This is the role they need. And, um, and yeah, as, he, as I said before, he, he'll, he'll be very upfront. He said, I'm, I'm not in the Hall of Fame. I'm not in, in Cooperstown without Tony La Russa, uh, at the assistance of Dave Duncan, making me the closer of the Oakland Athletic. And, you know, this brings me, this brings me into the segue here to what we're going to be talking about in 91. If you would have told me in 1990, because I watched a series on TV with the Nasty Boys and uh, <laughs> the Oakland A's, for God's sakes, that was their third in a row. They went to the, they went to the World Series. They lost to the Dodgers in 88. In 89, you know, you were there at this, the um, earthquake series where they were able to shut out the Giants. Now in 90, you know, Lou Pinella and the Reds defeat the Oakland A's. If you would have told me that last place Minnesota and last place Atlanta would be in the, probably the, world's, the best World Series that ever would be played, I would think you're nuts. What happened here? Yeah, and it's boggles the mind. That for the first time, we not only have a team go from worst to first or from last place to first place, we've got two of them. And both of these teams were awful, you know, the year before. I mean, the Braves were 65 and 97. I mean, that's, that's you know, that's, that's a terrible. You know, we talked about New York Mets from the amazing Mets era. And the other thing, nobody expected anything about the Twins, as you just pointed out, Ian, because in the season of down to the last pitch, you had the Oakland Athletics. They seem to be just ruling the roost, and the only team that seemed to be somewhat close to them are coming on were the Toronto Blue Jays. Nobody thought about the Twins. I mean, Twins were twins were you know kind of a vestige of what they had been when they won it at '87, with very few guys that had carried over. Pretty much just guys like Kent Herbeck and Greg Gagne and Herbie Puckett, etc. But it kind of shows the magic, and I think maybe this was this is maybe another part of that answer to that question. You, you asked earlier, you know, about changes in the game and how the game became the game we know today. So, you know, in this period, is both of these teams turned it around by having some young pitchers, guys nobody really knew, come out of nowhere and suddenly be stars. You know, the, the in a sense that John Smoltz becomes a Hall of Fame pitcher pretty much was starting the second half of 1991 for the Atlanta Braves. The Minnesota Twins have um, Jack Morris as their staff ace, kind of their hired gun. They don't make the World Series without Kevin Tappany and Scott Erickson. Back over again with the Braves, you've got Tom Glavin, a guy that's forgotten who is really awesome, being compared with uh, Sandy Koufax with Steve Avery. And all these guys kind of came out of nowhere, and they all came 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 of age. Glavin was pretty good in '90, obviously, but everybody else is starting to come of age uh, pretty much all at once in 1991. John Smoltz was one of the first 
baseball players, in a sense, to use um, a psychologist, help them vision out the game, and uh, starts looking at tapes of himself when he's pitching really well. He tries to imagine those tapes, starts to run them almost in his head when he starts to struggle out on the mound. His second half of the season, he's great. And somehow they get past an extraordinary Pittsburgh Pirates team, Bonds, Vanilla, et cetera, um, pretty much on the strength of these young arms. So these young arms, which I think we've kind of become a little bit more accustomed to today, you know, like Strasburg, Chapman, whatever it may be. Um, but this, this season was noted for it. And the number of young arms that not only came of age, but really pitched amazing games with all the chips on the line. Was was really pretty epic. And you know something? Not a lot of people give. You know, Bobby Cox is Bobby Cox. Okay. <laughs> you know, he's a legend now. But a lot of people don't even know about Bobby Cox that he that he managed the Braves in seventy eight to eighty one. You know, he 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 was a prior Braves manager thirteen years prior, and he managed the Toronto Blue Jays in the mid eighties. And he had Russ Nixon, and he was the general manager, Cox, fired him and, you know, began what would be the next 14 pests. But not a lot of credit is ever given to Tom Kelly. And I always uh, like to say that he was a genius. 87, he won the World Series. My cousin's a huge Minnesota uh, Twins fan, by the way. And um, I knew of Tom Kelly back in the '80s, and what he and he was always so calm, you know calm. His demeanor was so good, unlike his um, you know the guy that came after Rod Gardner. He was a firecracker compared. To, <laughs> he was right. a firecracker compared to Kelly. Uh, how come people don't give much credit to Kelly? He was a genius. Yeah, I think he was a genius, and in talking with him, in doing down the last pitch, he, he pointed out something I never thought of baseball in this way. And we're talking about pitchers, and we're kind of talking about Jack Morris. Uh, this must have been with Jack Morris in Game 7, where Morris goes back out to pitch the 10th, and they, there's a bit of a back and forth in the Twins' dugout where pretty much Tom Kelly says, you're done, and Morris says, how the hell I am? I'm, I'm going to pitch the next inning, and nothing you can do about it. And Kelly, to his credit, kind of went, okay, it's just a game and kind of backed off, and but he had the bullpen all set. If Morris had gotten into trouble. But the thing he pointed out in that discussion, which I never thought about baseball in this way, is we hear so much now about pitch counts. Oh, okay, he's over 100 pitches. Oh, geez, he's at 110, whatever it may be. He, Kelly watched time. How much time has my pitcher, my starter, been on the mound? You know, and he would almost keep a stopwatch or kind of add it up in his head. And once his pitcher, combined cumulative, got like more than two hours on the mound, he would start becoming a little bit worried. In a sense, he had kind of this racehorse background. He had some racehorses for a while. Uh, his family was into, you know, horse racing. I mean, he used to muck stalls and everything where he grew up back in New Jersey. And, and he kind of brought that over from there. And he said, I don't care about pitches, you know. I mean, you may have thrown that last pitch at 98. That's going to take a lot more out of you than maybe that slider you just threw with the next pitch. It was time. And and that's where he was getting concerned about Morris in game seven. He kind of went against, you know, his usual um, guidelines. But I found that so interesting that it wasn't pitch counts and all these other things we do today. He was just kind of at the end of the dugout. That's kind of, okay, how much time has my pitcher been out there? You know, and once it starts getting up to close to two hours, I've got to keep a better eye on him. And he was one of these guys with a team, I mean, he rode guys like Chuck Knobloch really hard, you know, young guys. Some of the older guys, Herbeck, Puckett, obviously, he would back off. They, they, you know, Herbeck talks about this game where the, it's early in the season, and they're getting, I think, believe it was in New York and the Bronx, and they're just, they're just getting killed early on. I forgot who was pitching, but he's not doing very well. And, and Herbeck just kind of shouts out in the dugout, geez, we're getting killed here. And uh, Kelly goes, yeah, do you think he can do better? And Herbeck goes, well, maybe I can. 
And, and so Kelly goes, okay, you're managing right now. You 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 manage the team. And Herbeck wasn't wasn't playing that day. And the Twins start coming back. And they you know they come back, make a game of it. I don't know if they won the game or not. That's not really the important thing. But about fifth sixth inning, Herbeck, you know, realizing what kind of slack his his manager's given him, suddenly yells out, "Wow." Okay, okay, TK, that's what they called him, Tom Kelly. I've done my job, and, man, I'm getting kind of whooped. This is a heavy burden being manager of this team. You know, I'm giving this back to you. And, you know, <laughs> Kelly just goes, okay, you know, thanks. You know, thanks for getting us back in the game there, Herbie. And, and that's the kind of thing that they played out. This was a very – the Twins were this interesting combination of a veteran team that had a lot of young components. But they grew up quick, as like Gagne and Leas, et cetera. And, um, and, and, and they just kind of brought it all together. I can still remember spring training that year in 91, going down to Florida and being in, oh gosh, where was it? Fort Myers. And, um, and, and I'm just trying to get the lay of the land. There wasn't any game scheduled that night. And I went by the stadium and I heard noise that very distinctive noise of a bat hitting a ball, you know, batting practice. And I'm going, what? Where is this coming from? And it's like dust. There's no lights on in the stadium. And and I just going, where is this coming from? And I ended up finding this door that was open, and it led down into this tunnel. And I'm now inside the stadium, and I ended up down, like, in the bowels of the stadium. And there was Herbeck, Gladden. Puckett, a um, couple more taking batting practice. This was an off day. They'd already done all their other stuff. And they saw me, and Puckett knew me from before. And he just said, oh, hang on, what's you, what you doing here? You know, who are you working for now? And I told him about Baseball Weekly, et cetera. And, and he just said, <laughs> I'll never forget, he said, look how sick we are. We could be out on the town. We're in here having batting practice. And that, that was that team. They just loved to work. And uh, they love to just hang out and do things. And you know, and you know, when you think about it, you know, in '87 the Twins won. I think they won seven games against um, the Cardinals. I think Terry Pendleton was on that team also. Mm-hmm. He was on mm-hmm. the uh, Cardinals. If I... Now, so it goes like this: Twins, A's in '88, A's in '89, A's in '90, and now Twins in '91. But they're missing a few. Of the their great players who really helped them in '87, number one, Frank Viola, he was just a, a wonderful left-handed pitcher that people forget about, and Tom Brunanski. Yeah, Brunanski was a great player, and Brunanski, you know, formed the middle of that order of batting order with Puckett and Herbeck, and so yeah, not a lot was expected of this team early on in the year, especially when you compare that lineup against the Oakland A's lineup, which has just been lights out. They haven't been winning probably as many World Series as they like, but they've got, you know, Henderson and Conseco, and here comes McGuire and et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, – but that's, as they say, that's why they play the game. And I think that's why the Twins – the Twins – you hear today, teams like to grind out at bats. You know, Boston's good at it, Dodgers, et cetera. The Twins were really good at that in 91. And then certainly this was done beforehand, but they relished that. They relished kind of driving the starting pitcher out of the game in the fifth or sixth. They, you know, they would come back and brag in the dugout. Yeah, I, you know, I fouled off seven against that guy. Can you do that? And, and it was always this, like, good-natured competition. And they would often um, – they talked so much during games and at bats, during game six of uh, – the World Series, one of the first interviews I did, Ian and doing down the last pitches, I went out to the West Coast and talked to Chili Davis. And Chili and I go back to when he played for the Giants. Um, I've always thought he was a marvelous player. And, 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 we, and I went out to talk about 91 in the series and the season, but mostly I wanted to talk with Chili about one thing. And that, I was looking at footage of game six, we're in extra innings, um, and Puckett is due up to bat. And before he goes up to bat, he has a very animated conversation with Chili Davis, who's in the on-deck circle. 
and 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 they had, and they you know they were kind of yelling at each other, but they had to yell because it was so loud inside the old Metrodome. It was like a jet airplane taking off. So it wasn't like they were like mad at each other, but they were just trying to get each other's point across. So one of the first questions, the first question I asked Chile is, I go, okay, game six, extra innings, Metrodome, Kirby Puckett going up to bat. Before he goes up to bat, you and him are having a really extended conversation. You guys are just going at it. And Chili just smiled and goes, hmm, I'd like to know what that was about. I went, Chili, I've come 3,000 miles. I'd love to know what that was about. And he told me a story I'd never heard of before, and I covered this theory. And he said, Kirby Puckett was, you know, Charlie Lee Brandt on the mound. And he doesn't hit guys like Lee Brandt very well. You know, kind of, you know, jump ball pitchers, a little bit on the outside corner of the plate, et cetera. I mean, that's that's not Kirby Puckett's bread and butter, or it wasn't. And he told Chili Davis, I'm going to bunt. <laughs> and, and now it's starting to come together, because I remember the point looking at the old TV footage where Chili Davis's eyes kind of get big for a minute. And and I said, oh, you didn't think much of that. He goes, like, yeah, you're right. I didn't think that was a very good idea at all. And so um, – Chili Davis is the one who convinces Kirby Puckett to swing away against Lee Brandt. And I believe the first pitch comes in, I forgot who the home plate, I think it was Al Montague, the home plate umpire, about knee level. Perfect pitch to bunt, because Puckett's plan was to bunt, get on base, probably steal second. He's, you know, good at stealing bases. And then Chili, he always called him Chili Dog, said, Chili Dog, you're going to drive me in. And we're going to win this game. We're going to force a game seven. And so the first pitch from Lee Brand comes in, knee level, home plate umpire calls it a strike, and Chili Davis is going, oh, no, that was a perfect pitch to bunt, and I told him not to. So now he's 0-1 in the hole. And um, and Chili starts yelling out from the on-deck circle, you were right. You were right, in a sense, bunch. <laughs> but the Fetcher Dome is so loud, Kirby Puckett never hears him. And on the third pitch, drives the ball out, and, um, you know, the Twins win, and Jack Buck has a great call. We'll see you tomorrow night. And uh, forces a game seven. Yeah, and I remember, uh, you, you know, you see that with uh, – uh, Kirby Puckett's face uh, just tells a million stories just as he rounds the bases. Uh, <laughs> now, now, you know, you bring up a very interesting point here, uh, Charlie Liebrand. You know, a lot has been made by Cox's decision to start him, uh, you know, to begin with, because he's in his mid-30s, he's about 36 years old. Do you think it was a mistake for Cox to uh, start Liebrand in the first game? Yeah. I don't know. You look back and he had, you know, maybe you can do better with Blab and whatever. But but Cox was um, Cox was very loyal, especially to the older players that got him to where he needed to be. And this um, and I think the Braves don't end up in the World Series without this kind of reassuring nature a little bit. I mean, he could have put Blab and who you know, pitches game two against Tappany. But it's funny, when that, that kind of manager second-guessing, I guess I go back to when I was talking with Terry Pendleton, um, who was on, you know, one of the stars of this Braves team, and he just would always say, we got here to a large extent because of Bobby Cox, and he always would call, he called like Bobby Cox grandma. He was like grandma. And I went, what you, what's, what's this grandma and grandpa stuff? And um, and he said, yeah, be like your grandpa, your grandma. You know, all hell can be breaking loose. Everything is all both apart at the seam. And think about it. you got a team that, you know, finished like 27, 20 games, 29 games off the lead the year before, had a lot of young guys, Mold, Avery, Glavin, et cetera, et cetera. And yet what they – got a lot of reassurance from was Cox being so calm and just kind of going with what he felt was kind of a known hand. And I I wasn't surprised he started Lee Brandt because um, I could you almost see him kind of shielding some of his young pitchers a little bit uh, with, with that. 
Glavin, I believe, was an option. Probably Smoltz couldn't have pitched because he was just coming out of the Pirates series in the NLCS. Avery, I'm not sure of what his status was. But even if all three of those guys, Avery, Glavin, Smoltz, were available and he started Charlie Learbrandt in game one, I still wouldn't have been that surprised because that's the way Hawks managed. He, he really tried to protect his younger players, and, and he really tried to stress always it's going to be okay. Hence the nickname Grandma or Grandpa, which Pendleton, you know, 25, 20 some years later, still remembers. That's the first thing he mentioned. When I said, "Tell me about your manager, Bobby Cox." He said, "Ha, huh. you know, he was just—I'd almost could picture him in a rocking chair there in the dugout, just going, okay, everybody relax. It's going to be okay. We're going to do okay here.'" And then, and they did. And, and you know something? You know, people don't realize. A few things about the 91 World. There was, a, you know, it, it was so close in many of those games. I think four out of those, the uh, seven games, was decided by uh, one run. And I think three of them went into overtime. If I'm yeah, not. three went to extra innings. Yeah. yeah. And, and four but, were last at bat. Yeah. And, and just an amazing thing. But here's – let's talk about some little tidbits that maybe people forgot. Let's talk about game two, and let's talk about Ron Gant and uh, Herbeck and what happened <laughs> over there, you know? Yeah, come on. You know, you know, you know i got to mention this stuff, you know, Tim. I mean, it's priceless, you know? <laughs> well, they ended up picking Ron Gant off um, first base, and, and Herbeck puts the tag on him. But in doing so, it kind of – it's so funny that, you know, things come around to guys that have kind of a track record in some of this stuff. It looks like Herbeck puts a wrestling move on him. And Herbeck, of course, had done a little bit of, you know, professional wrestling in the in the Twin Cities area, really kind of enjoyed that type of stuff. And it just um, incensed the Braves fans. And so they called Dan out. And you look at the replay, and you could make an argument either way. It kind of looks like Herbeck pulls him off the bag, whereas, which Gant really insisted he even pulled off the bag. He said, I mean, this big guy's got me in a bear hug, and, and I'm out. How does that happen? So, um, and, it's, and it's funny because um, it just incensed the brave faithful. And so Herbeck didn't hear the end of it when everything returns, go, goes to Atlanta for games three, four, five. And in a way, it, it kind of underscores, Ian, a little bit. These were, in their own ways, kind of the consummate um, home court advantages uh, in baseball, at least for that era. One was the Metrodome, which was kind of a very bizarre place to play, and a lot of people hated it. It was a place with the kind of the Teflon-colored roof that you could lose the ball up there. In fact, several were lost during this series. Um and it was so loud, and you had this baggie in right field, which was part of the wall. It was a very, very curious place. And, and the Twins knew how to win there. You flip it around, Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta, which is long gone now, too, um, wasn't the most picturesque ballpark in the world by any stretch of the imagination. But it was loud, too. This is the start of the Tomahawk Chop, which we still hear today. And I think this is we saw, certainly we've had big crowds before in baseball and everything, but in both places, between the Homer Hankies, the Tomahawk Chop, et cetera, you had baseball now not just being loud and boisterous and home home field advantage. It was kind of starting to become a little bit like a football game or even like a soccer game over in England or a little a little bit. Everybody had their chance. Everybody had their you know, their cheers. And you talk to the players um, on both teams, they still remember being a visiting player in either place, whether it's the Metrodome or Fulton County, and just going, that was tough. And I'm a pro. You know, I'm used to playing in tough places. I may have played in some tough places coming up in the minor leagues, whatever. But, whew, that was tough. And as you pointed out at the beginning of the show, home team won every game. And you talk to some of the Braves, if things had been reversed and they had the home field advantage, they're pretty much certain to a man they would have won. So it's uh, interesting how it plays out. And anything anything like, say, the Gantt-Kerbeck situation, um, 
maybe um, later some of the, the pitching confrontations, et cetera, it just kind of invigorated these, the fans in, in either place even more. And, uh, and it made it much, much more difficult to, uh, for the visiting players. Before I even get to game three and we go to Fulton County, I just want to veer off for a second. Similar to what you do in the book, it's just great. You know, you're starting a story and then all of a sudden, well, the building of Camden. Of, uh, Camden yeah, <laughs> Fulton County Stadium was a picture-perfect example of those round kind of, you know, mid-1960s stadiums like Veteran Stadium and, and Three River Rivers. Front Stadium, Three Rivers. They have no, they look like giant iron bowls that there's no there's no uh you know personality to it just cold iron and you like steel just like enclosed in it like you know Shea Stadium I remember that people hated Shea Stadium uh all of a sudden Camden Yards we have a new blueprint for what would happen for the next 30 years yeah and Camden I don't think you can underestimate how much that's changed the game and in essence, how close it became the building of Camden to being like a lot of those other multi-purpose stadiums you were just mentioning, Ian. Um, one of the things that blew my mind was a couple of years after Camden, it had to be soon after Camden opened in 92. So in, in 91, the racing to complete it, Sky Dome, now Rogers Center in Toronto, had been opened, which was, uh, you know, pretty epic. You know, re, you know, removable, uh, retractable roof, all that type of thing. And I thought initially more places would go toward that model, like Skydo and Toronto. And some have. I mean, Seattle, Safeco Field, et cetera. Um, but the blueprint, the template really became Camden. And I remember being in Larry Lucchino's office. Larry Lucchino was then president of the Orioles. And somebody's now championing Larry Lucchino to be in the Orioles Hall of Fame, and I'm stunned he's not there already because I visited with Larry right after Camden opened, and we were just talking, and he said, oh, hang on, here's something you should take a look at. And he reached into his filing cabinet and pulled out the original blueprint done by HOK, the esteemed baseball designers, for Camden Yards. It was mind-boggling. The warehouse would have been demolished. Um, the stadium itself would have had a lot of surface parking around it. It wasn't going to be kind of snug into the inner harbor, the Renaissance there in Baltimore. In a sense, it was going to look, a, to me, it would really be a lot of maybe Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City um, with a lot of, you know, almost like a suburban ballpark put in the middle of um, downtown. For the Orioles' credit, for Larry Lucchino's credit, and a woman named Janet Marie Smith, who he brought in, who is a big, uh, is a big architect uh, guru, they pushed back, and they said, "No, let's not, let's not do this. So let's 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 make it more fits into the cityscape." And they were so meticulous that they even went through how the angle of seats were kind of facing the field. Um, they were so meticulous that if you sit in the box seats in Camden Yards today, if you look down on the right-hand side, there's a little kind of outline of a ball player um, on, on the seat. Every seat has it. It says the uh, outline of the figure of Wee Willie Keeler, of course, played on the old Baltimore team way back when. And this is how meticulous they were. And I, can, I went to opening the first game at Camden, and uh, they were playing Cleveland. Uh, the Orioles had obviously seen it a bit before because they had been taking BP there, et cetera. You could have knocked over the, Cle- the many members of the Cleveland Indians with a feather because they were just, wow, check this out. This place is just a shrine. It's just a temple of baseball. And it's one of those few places, you know, all the places we were just mentioning before, I don't know. May the ball players may have liked some. May it would work for them. This is maybe the first place that both fans and ball players, and I'd say almost all ball players, they just loved it. And um, and, and it's and it's actually kind of comforting now to see the Orioles be contenders again and see that place filled. 
because I, I love just still going back up there. It, it, it literally turned the tables, turned the tide on baseball design, and all the stadiums, so many that followed. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, Target Field in, in Minneapolis, uh, Coors Field, um, the, the ballpark, uh, you know, used to call the Jake. Now I guess it's Progressive Field in Cleveland. It just goes on and on. And, and the All American Ballpark in Cincinnati, beautiful. Yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah. PNC yeah. Park. Oh, yeah. You can see it's the Roberto Park. Clemente. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful, all these parks. And it all started with Camden because they were able That's to right. take some of the elements of a Wrigley or a Fenway, what makes it so special to go to those places, and yet give you enough of the creature comforts and uh, the modern day accoutrements that, that make it more enjoyable. And and I think once that opened, nobody was going to, you know, nobody was going to be embracing bigger is always best. It was like, okay, how can we, especially in a downtown setting, how can we fit it in? And, and if you look at Baltimore, it, it helped with a real renaissance just in that city. And so I think a lot of other places took note of that too. Yeah. And, you know, now we move back to the series. And I love this too. Here's another tidbit that you're going to be laughing your head off. Twins were up to nothing. They interviewed Tom Kelly. He quoted, he said, hey, you know, you're going to, you're going to a National League ballpark. You can't use the designated hitter. And he quoted, Tom Qu- uh, Kelly was quoted as saying, managing without the designated hitter rule was right up there with rocket science. He was all the <laughs> time Right? So what happens in game three? He goes into the 11th <laughs> inning. He's one up. He's run out of players. He has to bat um, Rick Aguilera, for God's sake. Rick Aguilera. And Rick Aguilera almost won the game, too. I mean, he put a, he put did. a knock on that ball, I and mean, it just stayed up a little little too long. And, and and all of a sudden, this is where things flip around. Yeah, Kelly gets burned by his rocket science quote. <laughs> and uh, and what's amazing is here here comes, like, the new hero, Mark Lemke. He goes, whoo. And all of a sudden, this guy like comes out of the blue, and uh, and and would have been the World Series MVP if, uh, if the Braves would have won. I mean, he just um, and, and all of a sudden we, we're starting now. Not the series has changed in that you're getting new heroes coming up. Lemke, um, you know, certainly Dave Justice, you know, Fly Smith played pretty good in this game, but hmm, we'll see what happens down the road. And all of a sudden, the games are going maybe a little bit later. They're so frantic and whatever. And soon, relatively after this, I think it's after game four, the Atlanta paper runs a front-page story warning their readers about sleep deprivation because <laughs> you're up all night watching these games. <laughs> so, and everybody just has to their seat because, good gosh, this one goes, tw- you know, uh, 12 innings. And um, – Epic comeback, and we've got Atlanta winning. So it's it's uh, in that game. I yeah, here it is. That's in four hours, four minutes, which breaks the record. So um, so yeah, you know, Lemke drives them in, and away we go. And suddenly everything's flipped around again. It's so funny when you go back and talk with the players again from both these teams, and and sometimes I would just kind of roll some footage, and um, you know, we would just talk about it and whatever. And, I, and again, I think it was Pendleton at one point just went, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, that was crazy. And then finally, he, 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 you know, he's just like shaking his head. And I go, okay, how did you keep going in all this? I mean, it's like one twist and one turn. Those are the perils of Pauline. And he goes, I learned pretty much early on, and it was probably by, by game three, I had to stay really in the moment. Because if I got, like, out of the moment, if I got out of what was going on right now, what do I need to do right now, it became mind-boggling. It just kind of built up night after night. And uh, certainly that starts taking off in game three. And, and you know, we spoke about uh, game five would be a blowout. Um, they, they yeah, were... the only dog really in the bunch. So, uh, But even then, it's funny when you talk to the players, because they live 14-5 for Atlanta, it they feel they, they feel if Game Five had been another extra inning nail biter, they wonder if Game Six and Seven would have been as good. They feel like Game Five, okay, 
Atlanta goes ahead. Looks like they're going to maybe take the series now. They're feeling great, but it's, it's heading back to Minnesota for game six and seven. But it allowed everybody just to kind of take a breath and just go, okay, where are we? Braves feeling good. Twins not so much. But um, it allowed everybody to kind of ratchet it up one more time. And I think if you look back in at, um, say, great World Series, we've had a lot of great game sixes. I mean, you know, and, but often – the game after that, game six, you know, I'm thinking probably, what, Red Sox, Reds, you know, 75. Um, there's probably others. But, Mets, you know, Mets, after fifth, Sox. yeah, Mets, Red Sox. Game, game seven isn't, it, it isn't as good. Whereas this one, I would argue, you know, you've got Puckett's home run to win game six, which everybody kind of, you know, compares somewhat with fifth, deservedly so. But then game seven is better. Game seven, you got, you know, Smoltz and Morris going at it, the young and the old. I mean, it's almost like a Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader thing going on. And, um, and, and it just brought it up a notch. And, and it's funny when you go back and look at great world series, I'm hard pressed to think of one where you've had a great game six and game seven's even taken it up maybe a quarter step, but this one did. And, and you know what's funny? This is what this is what's deja vu because he wasn't. I mean, he was in the twilight of his career, Jack Morris. He was what about thirty six years old when he pitched here, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know. And here you have John Smoltz, who's about twenty some, and who's his boyhood hero from Detroit? Mm-hmm. Jack Morris. Jack Morris. He, yeah, he's, I mean, he's facing him in Game Seven. Ten innings. Jack Morris goes ten innings. Now, if this was today, I don't think he would have gone past five innings. No. And, in fact, we're going back to Tom Kelly, great manager. And it's funny. It took Jack Morris several years to have this even dawn on him. I mean, who who is really putting himself under the microscope? Who is really going to get it with both barrels if Jack Morris blows up and – the ninth inning, God forbid, the tenth inning, and loses the game, gives up a dinger to, I don't know, Kerry Pendleton or Ronnie Gant or somebody. It's Tom Kelly. And it took Morris a long time to realize that, how much Morris believed in him and let him go out, especially for the tenth, but even before then. Because he's got one of the best closers in the game, and Rick Aguilera warmed up and ready to go, rested and ready. And, uh, Hey, Aguilari isn't Dennis Eckersley, but he's darn close. And so I think you're right. I think so many managers today, maybe it's the scrutiny, maybe it's the pitch counts, maybe I, I'm not sure what it is. They wouldn't have taken some of the chances that these managers did in this in this series. And I think the reason they did, both Bobby Cox and Tom Kelly, is they knew their players and they went with their gut. And that was really a lot of fun to watch. I can still remember being in the Metrodome, and Morris is coming back out to pitch the 10th. Hey, what, what? Hey, what? You know, and Aguilar's just standing out there in the bullpen, and you're going, wow. And and it's funny. You know, Morris is thinking, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, you bet. Again, it wasn't until years later they realized how much uh, Tom Kelly took a risk in putting him back out there. And let's, let's talk about a little gold nugget that not a lot of people might know. Let's talk about Dan Gladden's bat. <laughs> this is something I didn't know, Ian, until I was talking with Gladden. And th- th- this is the stuff of legend. I mean, Gladden leaves off, in a sense, the bottom of the tent, and he hits it off the end of the bat, and at first it looks like it's going to – Brian Hunter, Braves left fielder, is going to maybe have a play on it. I mean, that's the way the ball originally looked. But Gladden and swinging the bat and hearing, you know, knowing it's hit the end, has felt the bat crack in the handle just a smidge. And he thinks to himself, it's going to die. It's not going to carry. In a sense, that it, you know, I, I, not enough oomph has been put into it. He just rounds first and he just goes for second. And, um, and the ball hits and suddenly there he is. And the, 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 the part of the story that I love is, the bat was cracked. And then in the in the celebration, you know, 
you know, with uh, getting driven in by Gene Larkin, etc. Game ends one nothing. All the hoopla. It isn't until much later that night. Glenn's left. Glenn's left the Metrodome. The celebration's going on in the Twin Cities. Then he suddenly goes, "Hang on, what happened to that bat? That'd be a great bat to have." And he sneaks back in. Um, I forgot with who else into the Metrodome. The doors open. They find the bat in a garbage can, and it's now the bat's um, on his mantle piece, and, you know, of course, where it should be, et cetera. And, uh, and I just love both ends of that story. The Gladden is going to take enough of a chance just based on this little tremor of a feeling that he feels in his hands going, that bat broke, I can go for an extra base. And then <laughs> many hours later as the party continues, so they go, like, what happened to that bat? And actually finding it in a garbage can in the metro, so you just go, wow! I mean, that that that's great. And, and you know, some you spoke to Terry Pendleton as well. He still believes to this day that the Braves were the better team. For sure. And in fact, well, we go back to Kirby Puckett's home run to win Game Six, for, force a Game Seven, and that, that Metrodome was a curious place, Ian. It was kind of a like I say, it was an interesting place. They had these big fans way set back up near the roof, um, behind home plate. And part of it, you know, part of it was just to keep the air pressure up and keep that roof up. And of course, that roof collapsed at one point during a blizzard many years later or something. And Pendleton, during the course of the games at the Metrodome, always kind of noticed that the fans were on when the Twins were batting. And the, the the fans were off whenever the Braves were batting. As he pointed out to me, with a pucket home run came up when we were talking, and he's going, "Yeah, okay, great home run, an epic home run, whatever." And I'm going, but I'm going, "Hang on, what? You know, it's not like you know, a little you begrudging this, you know, a little bit of sour grapes." And he goes, "No, no, no, no sour grapes." I'm going, "Okay, but what are you talking about?" And he goes, "All I know is." That fan was on when Kirby hit that ball. It sure wasn't on any time I ever went up to the plate. So, who knows? Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's the ultimate home field advantage. <laughs> and, and you know, some a piece of, a piece of the Braves uh, dynasty was missing at the time, and he was playing in Chicago at the time. Uh, Greg mm-hmm. Maddox, he won the Cy Young, and I remember the Yankees were so close um, to getting him, and, and along with. Uh, um, Jimmy Key and uh, David Cohn, who they later got. I was so disappointed. He goes to Atlanta. That, I think, was the one piece that was missing uh, from the 91 thing. But let me ask you this. Like Leonard said, let me ask you this. If the Braves would have won that, would they have gotten soft? Would they have held back on their laurels? Or do you think they would uh, have continued their run uh, as they did? I think they would have been a good team. Would they have had that incredible run of 23, 24 more appearances in the playoffs? I don't think so. Because this is something that surprised me, Ian, in doing down the last pitch was talking to Lemke, talking to Smoltz, was how uh, how much losing in 91 stuck with them. And they they were a team, team on a mission after that. And, uh, and it just kind of carried over and suddenly get great momentum. But losing it that way really, really hurt. And I think that, that, that made them, in a sense, one of the premier teams of the 90s. I, I don't think they'd become that without that. And, and I think it, it's like, you know, it's like a lot of these memorable teams. I mean, waiting in the wings, here's the Toronto Blue Jays, which have lost a couple in agonizing fashion a couple times, really accomplished teams, they they don't forget that. If anything, that becomes something that spurs them on. And I think the Atlanta Braves were that case. I think if they went in 91, I don't think they had this epic run in the playoffs that they that then go on to have. And, you know, out of left field here, near the end of the 91 season, you got Jim LaFarve calling you up. What the heck was that about? <laughs> uh Tim was calling me up, and I was somewhat critical of the Mariners, and he was then managing the Mariners. And he called me up and said, what are you trying to do, get me fired? 
that's the first time I've ever gotten a call like that. Now, granted, I was early in my career and I've gotten them since, but uh, um, and it kind of rocked me. And and we had a good discussion. I said, no, I'm not trying to get you fired, but I am, you know, writing a column sometimes, and sometimes your team seems to be really good, and other times, I don't know, seems to be dead on arrival. And uh, and and we had a good meeting in the minds. I mean, it wasn't like a one them over. But it wasn't until later I started thinking, why is he calling me? He must really be under the gun or feeling a lot of pressure if he's calling up, you know, some guy at USA Today. Uh, why doesn't he just shrug it off? And it wasn't until later on, and I realized that here was another thing that was starting to happen, was baseball was starting to break into the haves and the have-nots, at least financially. I think some of that has been smoothed over in recent years by these giant regional t- TV uh, packages. makes it easier for some of the so-called smaller market teams to compete. But that wasn't the case back then. And Jim LeFever and the, and the Seattle Mariners were becoming one of the first victims of this. They were competing in a division with the Oakland A's, which then were a juggernaut, Minnesota Twins, et cetera, they did not have the financial resources through their ownership at that point to sign like a prominent free agent or, or they always were like a couple pieces short. And in a way, maybe I was unfair because I was criticizing the manager maybe for that, for the product on the field with anything I should have been uh, criticizing maybe the front office and certainly the ownership. And the ownership changed soon after that. I think it was Jeff Smullyan sold the team. But, you know, when something like that is starting to play out in real time, you're not quite sure what's happening. But again, I wasn't, I didn't realize till seasons later. Oh, this is kind of the, this is the start of Moneyball to a certain extent. This is the start where, you know, the epic line out of Moneyball, you know, we're just beggars at the table. And the Seattle Mariners at that point in time, I mean, they didn't even really realize it. I mean, their manager didn't realize it, but they were, they weren't quite able to compete on equal turf, say, with Oakland or some of the other teams. And you know some I'm going to end my inquiry here, but I do want to get you back to the show because there's a lot of things I'm missing. Uh, a couple of them with uh, Pete Rose, another one, Nolan Ryan's, uh, you know, no-hit game at 40, 44 years old. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, Dennis Martinez over there pitching a perfect game. And you got Roger Maris being recognized finally 30 years after the fact uh, that his home run uh, eclipsed. Babe Ruth, uh, we'll talk about Seattle, we'll talk about Moneyball, we'll talk about Toronto and leading up to the strike of uh, 94, because I think this all ties into the 91 season as well. Oh, I'd love to. I, I think you're absolutely right, too. And then there's such major winners and losers between all the upheaval and turmoil that pretty much, like you say, can be traced back to 91. It, it's pretty amazing. And what I'll do is I'll send you an email because i got to send you an email anyway. Hold the line. i got to end the show, and then I just want to speak to you for a second. Folks, I hope you had a great time. I hope you had a great time again, Tim. I mean, this is this was stellar, you know. I mean, I, our first interview was awesome. This was stellar. <laughs> it's always a good time with you. You ask great questions, my man. <laughs> you know, this was stellar. But, um, folks, go out and get – you know, down to the last pitch, because I'll tell you, it's just more than seven games. Uh, it is seven games of probably the best World Series, but you're going to get an understanding of how baseball was like, uh, you know, prior to the Bud Selig era. You still had Pete Rose coming out of jail. You still had Faye Vincent as a uh, commissioner, you know, when you had, like, Tim so pointed out, you know, the rise of Moneyball, the rise of um, the game getting different, the rise of stadiums. Things were changing in the 1990s. You still didn't have the current playoff, um, you know, mode that we have now with wild cards and all this. You still had to win a division uh, going back to 1969. Pick this up. We'll have Tim back on the show. As always, I'm Ian Kahanowitz. Thank you so much, Tim, for a great show. And in the immortal words of Edward Amaro, good night, folks. Good luck. 
We'll see you next time.